Um, so, yeah, we're really pleased to have Pete with us this week. Um, he was an undergraduate in Oxford studying PPE and he did postgraduate as well. Um, and during his time here, he received three blues in rugby. He's since worked for Christians in Sport, um, overseeing the support of professional athletes, and he is now a senior minister at a church in London. But I realise if some of you have been to these talks every day, you'll have heard all of these facts. So, we're going to introduce a new fact about Pete. Um, today. Random fact, um, he was the image of the 1999 Rugby World Cup publicity. So he was plastered all over billboards and loads of other things um, around the UK. And he's going to tell you a bit more of that. Um, so I'm going to invite him up now. Well, welcome in out of the rain. I feel I should clarify because that sounds a bit larger. It makes it sound like I had a, a career in modelling. If you're in the front five rows, you'll know that that definitely wasn't the case. I was actually the shadow of the 1999 Rugby World Cup. They decided to make it atmospheric and have a shadow of a rugby player holding a rugby ball. One of my friends put it this way. He said, well, Pete, that makes sense because after all, you've got a face for radio, not for TV. I think that's a little bit harsh, but there we go. So that was what was going on. Now, we're looking at tolerance today. And I've been saying all week that these five lunchtime talks hopefully pull together as an integrated whole. So we looked at relevance on the first day, does Christianity matter? Because we were thinking if you're not even persuaded that it's important, um, you're unlikely to want to ask further questions. Then truth yesterday, how do we know it's true? Well, of course, in our culture, once we raise the spectre of truth with any sense of conviction, the question of tolerance, the other T, comes up pretty quickly on its heels. How can we make or debate um, truth claims in a way that doesn't seem to be um, dismissive, bigoted, um, you know, of other people who would hold different opinions to where we are? And therefore the question is, um, tolerance is Christianity judgmental? We're looking at that today. Tomorrow we'll be looking at pleasure. What does it actually feel like? What difference does Christianity make for those who um, you know, want to experience it? And then identity. What difference does it make to me as a person in the sense of who I am? So tolerance today. Now, I suppose one of the things about the world that we, that we live in is that increasingly we are rubbing shoulders with people from very different backgrounds. You would notice that if you were able to compare even the Oxford student population with just 10 years ago. We're much more multi-ethnic, much more uh, multi-racial, um, multi-opinion in lots of different ways because the globalization of our society has meant that different um, tribes and tongues and nations and cultures are coming together as travel gets easier. You know, we have that. I mean, I'm a pastor of a church down in London. We seem to have about 75 people on a Sunday, and last count, we have 14 different primary nationalities. So people from, you know, uh, not using English as their first language, 14 different ones. On my street, or the street near me, I counted eight different restaurants of uh, different food, which is fantastic for me. I love that. But you just, it's a fact that we have a plurality of cultures in the melting pot today in the UK society. And because of that fact, one of the big questions is, well, how do we get along? Because you'll know if you spend any time with someone from a different culture, or different background, or different nationality, that you can often have these just easy misunderstandings by virtue of the fact that you assume certain things about what each other are saying. So how do we, how do we get on when we might have different opinions, or when we might just misunderstand one another? I used to work in... Um, management consultancy and marketing particularly, and I was always fascinated at the difficulties companies had when it came to releasing products into foreign markets, because often their slogans or their advertising campaigns wouldn't quite get the mark. So the Scandinavian make Electrolux tried to release its vacuum cleaner into the US market and was um, a bit unsure about its slogan, but went with this and it didn't quite work. Their slogan was, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. <laughs> Vauxhall released their car into the Spanish market and couldn't work out for the first month, true story, why it wasn't selling. The Vauxhall Nova went into the Spanish market. Nova in Spanish means doesn't go. The car that doesn't go. <laughs> Pepsi had a global slogan, Pepsi revives. When they tried to translate that into the Chinese market, unfortunately it got translated like this. Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> It's just easy to misunderstand. We think we're communicating the same language, we think we're making similar claims, and yet we just talk past each other. And so the dominant mode or ethic or virtue of how we engage has, um, is tolerance, you all know that. It's talked about all the time, and it's as if that if we can stick to the ethic of tolerance, we're going to be able to get on. 
Now, we need to understand where that's come from, what we mean. I remember when I was studying here, my tutors would always say, you need to define your terms when you're writing an essay or when you're about to undergo a tutorial. Define your terms. And I think one of the dangers we have with tolerance is that we assume we all know what we mean by the words. But actually, it's quite a slippery concept. So let's try to work it out. Let's go to that um, great bastion of um, all ideas, the Oxford English Dictionary. But you love the fact that when you play Scrabble with someone, you're from the town or the city you study there, where we have the authoritative dictionary. I love lording that over people. It says more about my personality than anything else. So the Oxford English Dictionary for Tolerance says, to tolerate is to respect others' beliefs or practices without necessarily agreeing or sympathizing. Okay, so to respect others' beliefs or practices without necessarily agreeing or sympathizing. But not every dictionary shares that, um, shares that definition. So the online dictionary in Carter, which is used by millions of people worldwide, says to tolerate is to accept the existence of different views or to recognize other people's right to have different beliefs or practices. Okay, so that's the acceptance of the existence of different views. But what is really fascinating is that's the verb to tolerate, but the noun tolerance has a different definition. The Encarta Online Dictionary defines the noun tolerance as the acceptance of different views. The accepting of the differing views of other people. So notice the difference. One is the acceptance of the existence of different views. The other one is you've actually got to accept the different views. So you move from acceptance to endorsement. Now that is very slippery, it's subtle, but it's a really significant opinion change, or a really significant change there, because what if I disagree with your view? On one level of definition of tolerance, that's okay. I can accept you've got a different view, and I need to accept that, but I don't need to agree with it. The other one seems to imply that I'm being intolerant if I don't actually accept your view, if I don't think it's a valid view. Now, that's quite interesting, isn't it? And um, I suppose one of the problems with that is that once we shift from one to the other, we get various issues. So ideologically, I think that that's quite concerning because it means that we have to kind of, we have to all buy into relativism. That means if I have to accept your view, we have to all buy into the view that all views are the same. Now, I don't know how your Oxford tutorials are if you do an art subject. My hunch is, if that were the case, your tutorials would be mighty boring. You know, you'd arrive, let's have a debate, well, we all agree. Do we? Yeah, yeah, all truth is relative, so therefore your opinion is equally as valid as mine, no debate. I mean, it's a caricature, but that would be part of the problem. If you don't really think there's a point of difference, and you don't really think that there's much point in debating it, then you don't have a discussion, so you don't make progress. I'm not slamming relativism at the moment, I'm just saying that if we've got to all accept that our opinions are, are all acceptable, we, we all buy into them, where's the debate, where's the discussion? Ideologically, I think that's a problem, but practically or legally, it becomes quite dangerous. So, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff in the papers about Section 5 of the Public Order Act, where you can be arrested for, and here's the definition, threatening, abusive, or insulting behaviour. Now, that sounds reasonable as we start off with, but the problem with it is that what is defined as threatening or insulting is usually in the eyes of the person who's on the receiving end of it. Now, what happens if you say something which is misconstrued by someone that they find threatening or they find insulting, but that wasn't your intention? You were just, you know, you just weren't very careful with what you said. So, for example, a 16 year old was arrested for having a placard saying, Scientology is a dangerous cult. Arrested. Arrested for that. It's just an expressing an opinion because someone found that insulting. Or, closer to home, in Oxford in 2005, a rather drunk student went up to a uh, mounted police officer on horseback and stupidly, not his finest hour admittedly, but stupidly said this and got arrested for it. Excuse me, officer, I think your horse is gay. Stupid, right? He didn't mean anything by it, he was arrested for it. Now, I'm not trying to kind of, you know, scare us with the nanny state or a kind of, you know, a... Uh, 1984 or something like that. But what I'm just saying is, is that, you know, legally once we try to enforce the opinion that we're, all of our opinions are equally valid and we all have to accept them, then that is where it leads legally. And that is why people are campaigning against Section 5 of the Public Order Act. Now I want to be clear, the Bible is clear. It's vital there is freedom of expression. It is vital that we do respect one another and we do listen to each other's opinions and we let people engage with it. So, but I think respect is a much better virtue than tolerance. 
Because I think respect says that I value you as a human being, as someone made in the image of God. I value your right to an opinion. I want to discuss with you, I want to debate with you. But I think because you're a human being, you might get it wrong. I don't necessarily think I'm the great arbiter of truth. I think there is such a thing as truth, but I want the discussion. I respect you, I respect your right to have an opinion, but you might be wrong. You might be really sincere, but you could be sincerely wrong. So I'm not going to fudge and say we're saying the same thing. I want to have an honest discussion with you. So I don't want to quash you, but I do want the discussion. That's the respect, but I think tolerance has got some problems with it. Let me try to unpack some of the problems with tolerance. Um, first of all, I think tolerance is a very negative concept. I think respect is a positive concept. It affirms the dignity of human beings, whereas tolerance, I think, is a negative concept. Let me um, explain to you what I mean. Imagine that um, you were really kind and you thought, you know, Petey looks like he's lost some weight since his rugby player days, I need to feed him up. So, Pete, you're going to come around for dinner and you invite me around for dinner. So I go around for dinner with you and the next day, you know, some people say, oh, you had dinner with that, um, with that guy or that girl. How was it? I say, well, tolerable. How was the food? I could just about tolerate it. Now, what would you think? You wouldn't be thinking that I had a brilliant evening, would you? No, because tolerable, or I could just about tolerate it, it's kind of like a, um, it's like a damning with faint praise, isn't it? It doesn't imply that I really enjoyed my time with you. See, tolerance is a very negative concept. It's a pretty low bar on things. Or um, I wonder if you've noticed how quite often in the public sphere, when people are debating an idea, they retreat to this idea of, I'm entitled to my opinion. I wonder if any of you listen to um, Five Live and, you know, the kind of sport talk. Don't imply that you all just listen to Radio 4 and you're all very intellectual. I know some of you listen to Five Live Radio Sport Talk. And what happens in that is that when people are debating about the right tactics of sport or something, quite often you'll hear the white band man on the end of the phone saying something like, He'll say, well, I'm entitled to my opinion. After I, I spend my money, I spent my money to go to the game, I'm entitled to my opinion. Now, it's interesting because, as a philosopher called Jamie White from New Zealand has um, argued, that phrase, I'm entitled to my opinion, is a complete non sequitur in the debate. So, you know, you and I are debating about the nature of God. And I'm saying, I think God is like this, and you're saying, I think God is like this. And I say, because I feel a bit threatened, well, I'm entitled to my opinion. What does it do? First of all, it shuts the debate down straight away, doesn't it? Because you're thinking, well, hang on, if I disagree with Pete now, am I, am I stamping on his right to have an opinion? So it, it just kiboshes the debate straight away. But notice that it's not at all about the substance of the debate. We're having a debate about God, and I then quote something about my right to have an opinion. We're not debating rights. We're debating truth about the nature of God. Jamie White puts it this way. He says, by invoking your right to hold an opinion for all you've contributed to the discussion, you might as well have pointed out that elephants have large ears. But why do we do that? You see, because I think we've got this culture of tolerance, and so we sometimes hide behind it because we don't want to actually really look and evaluate our opinions and think that they might actually be wrong. Let me say, I became a Christian because someone provoked me into considering the possibility that I might be wrong. And something that I was, frankly, too proud of until that point to really think about. They said, look, Pete, if it's true, look at it. And we talked on the first day about this open scepticism that Christianity invites. It invites you to come along with your questions, to be sceptical, but not to be dismissive. I wonder, sometimes tolerance seems to me to be a veil which we hide our scepticism behind, but we dismiss the idea of being open to new opinions and new ideas. But as you'll know, that leads you into a kind of epistemic void, a void of knowledge where you won't ever progress. So I'm just nervous about tolerance. It can sometimes hinder vital debates. Thirdly, tolerance can itself become oppressive. Because if we take by tolerance the view that you can't make a truth claim that implies any other truth claim is wrong, then think about it. If you're saying, well, if you can't make any truth claim that will imply any other truth claim is wrong, then what you're really saying is that there is one truth in the world, and that truth is relativism. You see, when you make the claim that you can only make a claim if it's not saying that any other claim is wrong, that claim itself, you're claiming to have absolute truth. Or to put it another way, sometimes you hear the people say that in a tolerant society, opinions should be kept privately when it comes to religion and things like that. Now, what, what the difficulty with that is, is that imagine that you're part of a, a religion or a worldview that says actually that your religion or worldview has to necessarily be in the public sphere as well as the private sphere. That is the worldview that is now outlawed effectively. The claim of Christianity and Judaism and Islam 
is that actually your faith is not really purely a private thing. It is a public thing as well. So the view that's arising today that actually we need to keep all religion into the private sphere is actually riding roughshod over religions that disagree with that. So that means that there's one view you're allowed to have in the marketplace of ideas in the public, which is the view of tolerance. And if you don't hold that view, you need to shut up and go home. Now, I'm putting it starkly, but that's where it goes. You see, it overrides other opinions if you're not careful. It doesn't allow other opinions to grow up. I think respect is much, much better than tolerance. Ironically, tolerance, without meaning to, can become a form of oppression of opinions that actually claim truth, which is not what was intended by it, but that's where it can go. So the problems with tolerance. Well then next, I wonder if there's an alternative to tolerance. I wonder if there's an alternative to tolerance. Here's a gospel alternative to tolerance. It's interesting that when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ in, um, in the Gospels, he's described as someone who's full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Now, I don't know if you notice that some people around you will be really good at one and some will be really good at the other, but it's rare you find someone who's good at both. So maybe you're the person who's particularly gracious, you're kind and you're accepting and um, people like to be around you and you welcome debate and ideas. Or maybe you're truthful and you're like a bull in a china shop and you go out there and you're like, let's have an hour, let's debate, but you can just sometimes tread on people a bit. Um, a couple who are very good friends of mine, I'm a um, godfather to their second son. They kind of embody this, actually. He's left Oxford, he was a student worker at Snap, so now he's not here, I can talk about this. Um, so um, the, the guy, Phil, I think he's got a great ministry of truth, he's naturally a very truthful guy, and his wife, Katie, she's a very gracious person. And um, this came home to me when I first met my godson. So my godson was about four weeks old, and um, I went around to see my kind of godson, and it was rather bizarre, I walked into the house, and um, Katie and Phil greeted me, and they had little baby Eddie there, and then they, uh, they said to me, hey, it would be great for you to hold Eddie, why don't you two have some time to get to know each other? Which is odd when you've got a four-week-old child. So I was then handed this child. Now, I'm a rugby player. You know, I, I'm not necessarily sure, I've not been to any of those kind of you know, pre-birth classes or you know, had the, had the um, instruction of how you hold a child. So I got Eddie and I just, I remember looking at him and thinking, your head is very large. <laughs> that with babies, their heads are very large in comparison to the rest of their body. And then something came into my head, but I don't know if it was a voice from the past, I think I remember my mother once saying, if you ever hold a baby, make sure you cradle its head. Now I didn't want to find out what happens if you don't cradle a baby's head, but I just thought I've got to cradle this baby's head. So I had my godson, arm under in there like that, and I decided to cradle his head with a hand around that. Now you can see, that is not a good, <laughs> that's not a good way to hold a child, is it? But anyway, so I held the child like that, and then as I say, Phil and Katie then said to me, well, look, you know, Pete, you, you have some time to get to know each other, so they left the room. So I'm there in their front room, <laughs> holding Eddie, my godson, four weeks old, like this. Now after a while of holding like that, this arm got particularly sore when I extended my ankle. So, you know when your muscles get really sore and um, you know they start to kind of, you know, they start to shake a little bit? This arm started to shake and he started to kind of stir and was very happy with this kind of vibrating <laughs> So he then started to stir a bit and I thought he's going to cry and I thought, oh, this is not going to, not going to sustain. What do I need to do? I don't know. What I need to do is I need to, um, I need to hold him in a different way. He's about the same size as a rugby ball at Dawn Gummy. I would hold him like a rugby ball. So I just popped him under my arm. I've got a good grip on me. I didn't often, you know, I just held him under my arm. So I'm holding him like that, and, that's, and suddenly I'm happy, he seems happy ish. <laughs> so I walked around. After a while, of course, Phil and Katie came back in the room. So Katie came in and she kind of looked at me. There's <laughs> only another can, and she kind of she said, Pete, what are you doing with my son? And I explained to Katie, the gracious one, I said, Katie, it's fine. I was holding him like this and it didn't seem to work, so now I've decided that he's about the same size as a rugby ball, <laughs> which is no problem at all. And I can hold him and he's happy and I'm happy. At that moment, Phil runs in and he goes, mate, what are you doing? And grabs his son off me. And I thought, that is a bit harsh. So pushing back, because I'm a person of truth as well, and by the way, I said, what's your problem, Phil? We were very happy. He said, Pete, you forget. I've played rugby with you and I know what your hands are like. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, a great ministry of truth. Katie, a ministry of grace. But what is astounding about the person of Jesus Christ is that in him, we see an embodiment of both together. It is astonishing. See, the person of Jesus Christ, when he comes on, he's so gracious with people that the marginalized flock to him. 
You know, he says, do not hinder the little children to come to me, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Little children who were the marginalized of the day, you know, should be definitely not heard, if alone at all seen. They ran to him. People who are ostracized, cut off from society like the lepers, or last night we heard brilliantly from Andy about the woman who had um, been dealing with this horrendous bleeding injury that she'd had for many years, came just to get a touch of the hem of his cloak. People came to Jesus, there was a beckoning attraction about him, they found him so gracious. And yet, at the same time, he was passionate about truth. You know, here was the guy who, who really, in some ways, went to the cross, died for the cause of truth. Remember in the trial, the crucial moment in the trial before the high priest comes when they say, tell us, are you the Christ? He doesn't say, well, I don't know, all truth is relative. No, he says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with glory and with his father's angels. There's an answer for you. And they rend their clothes, tear them apart, and say he must be crucified. He will not compromise on the truth. He's so passionate about the truth that when he sees the corruption that's come into the temple, he overturns the moneylenders and casts them out. Now, how do you hold those two together? Here is this guy who's so gentle that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he won't snuff out. And yet he's absolutely like a flint on truth. It is very attractive. It's not at all what we would expect. And it's interesting that when you read the New Testament, Jesus seems pretty keen on what the issue is when it comes to truth. And this is the issue that I want to um, try to help us to grasp. But there is a problem when it comes to human beings making truth claims, and this is it. We take a relative thing, we take something like an aspect of truth, and we make it absolute. We take a good thing and we make it a bad thing by making it an absolute thing. Let me explain what I mean. Communism. Communism was actually, to start off with, a very helpful corrective about a creeping individualism into the West. And it valued the collective, the community, the state. And that's a good thing. There are good things about that. The problem was, was that when communism became the ideology, the capital T truth, at the expense of all other things, the absolute, when it becomes the absolute, then a group of people or an individual can justify anything in its defense. So if individuals stand up against it, get rid of them. You know, if freedom comes up against it, it doesn't matter. Compromise freedom for the sake of the truth of communism. That was what happened. Once something becomes an absolute, an absolute important, you will justify anything to protect it. It's part of human nature. So Jesus is very clear about the danger of truth. He hammered the religious leaders of the day for doing exactly that. They so wanted to protect their religious power, they were riding roughshod over people. Jesus said that's the fundamental orientation of the human heart. We take an aspect of God's good plan or God's good creation, we absolutize it and we make it the truth, capital T. And when we do that, we'll ride roughshod over all other things. And dare I say that Christianity has done that. That was what the Crusades were about. They took the truth about the importance of taking the good news to the nations. And they took the truth about the fact that it's a good thing for people to profess faith in Jesus Christ. And they rode roughshod over other people and other cultures because they so pursued a conversion agenda that they said it's convert or die. That was what happened. That is not Christianity. Jesus never does that. That is idolatry. It is taking a good thing, making an ultimate thing, and then it becomes a bad thing. It is idolatry. And we do it today, and we're in danger of doing it with relativism or tolerance. When we make tolerance the supreme virtue, if we're not careful, we will ride roughshod over other people who want to make a truth claim and say, no, I don't agree with you. It is different. I respect you, but I don't agree. They will be the ones marginalized, which is why you often get caricatures of those who claim religious truth, or they're all intolerant. How many people have actually taken the time to talk to those people and see, are they intolerant? Or is it just a caricature? A good thing becomes a bad thing when it becomes an ultimate thing. So what is the solution? Well, I put it to you that the solution is this grace and truth. It's very interesting to me that the Declaration of Human Rights has evolved. So the Declaration of Independence where was um, kind of key for shaping the Declaration of Human Rights. And the Declaration of Independence in 1776 said this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That changed to this Declaration of Human Rights today, Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience. 
and to act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. Notice the change. The change is, one is that you get your dignity and your value and your importance from a creator who gives it to you. The other one is an assumption that somehow it's just there. And one of the great problems is if you take away the source of value that underpin human rights, I think you will inevitably lead to riding roughshod over people. Grace means this. It means that we are so valued and loved by God because we're created in the image of God. We have an, we have a, an integrity and a dignity and importance to us as human beings. That means regardless of the opinion you hold, I see in you the image of the glory of God. And I say you are important. You are significant. I respect you. I'm going to value you. I'll engage with you because I respect you for your importance. <coughs> And grace also means this, it means you're so important that Jesus Christ came to die for you on a cross. That is how valuable you are. God would not even spare his own son for you. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That is grace. You have an infinite worth, every one of us, regardless of whether we believe a particular creed or not. An infinite worth. And that gives you grace and gives you value and dignity and the basis on which I would engage with you. But there is objective truth as well. There is capital T truth. It is possible for us to be wrong. And I need people around me who will correct me when I'm wrong. I need truth tellers. I need to invite debate from you so that you can point out whether I'm wrong. But we need to do it in a spirit of humility and a, hu and a spirit of respect. As I close, it's notable for me that actually throughout history, when people have really embodied this truth of grace and truth, this wonderful gospel, that they've lived amazing lives. William Wilberforce, of course, was a Christian, and it was his personal convictions from reading the letter of Philemon that actually led him to wanting to abolish the slave trade. In his fight for the slave trade, because it was such a culturally entrenched view at the time, he was demonized by many people for many years. Famously, though only hiddenly, because it comes up in one of his biographies, at one point, one of the main protagonists who'd been really hammering him and demonizing him for many years, he died. Wilberforce, in secret, made sure that this man's widow was well cared for and provided considerable expense to, um, to sustain her financially. All are all hidden. That is grace. He disagreed with the man in his opinions, but he loved him and treated him with great respect. And dare I say that it was that grace and that truth that meant that ultimately slavery was abolished in 1807, and thank God he did. My hope and my prayer is not that I expect that, you know, we're all going to agree on everything. My hope and a prayer is that we can respect each other enough to debate, to not fudge and say we all agree, but to seek after the truth. That's why we put this week of events on. But as we pursue the truth, we can do it in a gracious manner that invites public debate and in which it thrives rather than squashing it. Okay, um, we're going to kick off the question and answer now. So if you're leaving, can you, you know, leave quietly and um, <laughs> uh, we'll get started. Uh, so I'd like to welcome, well we've already met Pete, um, we've got Andy and James here who are going to join the question and answer panel. I'll just uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves. Great. Hi, I'm Andy. I uh, did a history, history degree towards the end of the, uh, the last century um, here at uh, Exeter College. Now work at church in North Oxford. I'm James. Uh, my degree was in literature with language and linguistics, which is a little bit more interesting than it sounds. And uh, I work at St. Ed's Church. Thank you. Can we have the first question, please? Not a question. <laughs> I thought Pete would like to know that the rugby ball is a position midwives use. I'm married to one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks that, for that. that, wasn't, that wasn't good. Next question. Start comments next. Great. Um, you talked about respect instead of tolerance. Would you say that Christians, by suggesting their faith is the only right one, are respectful of other opinions? Yeah, um, I think that's, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that um, because to respect is not to say that we and you and I have to agree, it's to say that. You are a human being, you've got inherent value, and therefore you are, you have, you, part of that value is your ability and your capacity um, to form freely your opinions, um, to do that. Now, your opinions may be wrong. I'm not making a judgment necessarily on that about whether right or wrong. I'm just saying that to respect you says I'm allowing you the freedom of expression and freedom of thought. 
and I value that in you as I value that in myself. That is part of respect, being made in the image of God. But it's a, it's a confusion to therefore say, if I disagree with you, that I don't respect you. I'm going to give you a very trivial example. Imagine that I'm you know, about to kind of come here this morning and I you know, put on certain clothes. My wife looks at me and she says, oh, don't wear that. Until I will be laughing at you. Maybe you're thinking that she should have done that anyway. But there we go. And now, that, she's not disrespecting me, actually, by doing that. She's just disagreeing with me. And a disagreement and a disrespect are entirely different things. One is about the nature of the value and the worth of the human person. The other one is about whether the validity of their opinion, whether it's actually true or not. And we get things wrong all the time, any measure of humility. So I personally want to invite people to debate with me rather than resist it um, and hide behind, you know, kind of tolerance on it. So I think respect is about value, not about whether we agree on everything. Next question. Talk to me about monogamous homosexuality. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. I appreciate that that is a, a deeply personal question and I don't want to take it lightly at all. Um, I think one probably ought to start by saying that to the extent that uh, Christians or the church has been responsible in any, to any degree for homophobia or for a homophobic attitude or to make people who are homosexual feel got out or vilified. That is a terrible thing and uh, the church is, is, is right to apologise for that. Um, the, the Bible just has an assumption that God as the creator God is the one who is best placed to tell us how we are designed to live and that uh, he made us, he knows how we are wired and he knows what is best for us. And uh, the Bible does say that the appropriate place for sexual activity and for sexual expression is within lifelong heterosexual marriage. And I'm aware, even as I say that, of how extraordinary it sounds, and I guess there are a number of possible responses that might be coming to people's minds as I speak. It might be that um, we think, well, if I were to become a Christian, wouldn't that therefore mean that in some way my identity would be, that I would lose, lose my identity, who I was if I'm a homosexual person? And I think the Bible's response to that would be to say that um, actually our identity is a slightly more complicated thing than simply defined by our sexuality. I, I guess Pete's going to be speaking a bit more about identity on Friday. It might be that we think that were I to become a Christian, Therefore, in some way, I would be diminished as a human being and that my life would become less than what it is now. And again, I think the Bible would say that that's not the case. It would gently push back on that and would say that uh, at least part of the claim that Jesus is making is that in coming to him and in submitting our life to him and living for him, that what we find is, far from our lives being diminished, even though there is cost attached to coming to him, we will find that our lives are fulfilled and that uh, he describes it as a life to the full. I don't know if um, anyone wants to add anything to that. But just to say, I think one of the things that sometimes people feel, I, I, I have a couple of um, pastoral relationships, people I'm supporting for whom this is a live issue, so please, and it is an ongoing discussion, one guy has been for the last three to four years. Um, and one of the big battles I think for him is to distinguish between sexual orientation when he feels his desires are leading him and sexual expression, the right and best place for him to express that. And that's something that actually all of us have to work out, um, heterosexual or homosexual. You know, what is our sexual orientation? That's a key question. But what is the right forum for sexual expression? That's a key question. I think where the waters have got muddied really unfortunately, and I think the Christian church has been guilty on this, is um, not distinguishing clearly between the two. So God does not accept or reject people at all on the basis of sexual orientation. It's just not an issue that he rejects or accepts people on the basis of that. He's just not on the, it's not on the table. Sexual expression is on the table about what is the right form of sexual expression. And so I just want to be very nuanced and careful about distinguishing between those because I think the identity thing that James mentioned is key. People who have a, a certain orientation will then fulfill where you're just, you're, you're just saying I'm invalid as a person. That is not what's being said at all. But expression, which is something we all got to grapple with, heterosexual or homosexual, is actually is on the table. Um, but please, it's an ongoing discussion, saying in three or four years that I'm with one person, ongoing, will be for the rest of his life, I'm sure. So please come and talk to us about that, or talk to someone you feel you can open up to about it. Thanks. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to 
Is God intolerant of those who don't believe in him? Yeah, thanks. It's a, a, a good question um, as well. The reason I think that, I mean, I, I guess what lies behind that question is a sense that, that tolerance is the, the ultimate virtue, in a sense, as um, uh, Pete was, uh, was saying. If you like, so it's almost like the, the main criteria that must be applied to God is that he must be, he must be tolerant. I suppose the question I want to say is actually, what is the right way to, to live? If God has created us, if he's given us good things to enjoy, the right way, the best way actually for us to live is to recognise him, to acknowledge him, to, to live for him. And actually it's right, I think, for God, if you like, to, to push us towards what is best for us by encouraging us to believe in him and actually warning us of the consequences if we don't. Uh, so God is ultimately right. He is the, the definition of what is good and virtuous. Actually, tolerance, you can't make the absolute virtue, it seems to me. And, um, and there are a, a, a number of things in the Bible that um, speak of God's tolerance in, 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 in a sense, if I can put it like that, which is, what does he do in order to uh, avoid uh, condemning people? who continue to live in opposition to him, or continue to live ignoring him in the world. What he does is he comes into the world, says the Bible, in the form of his son, and he pays the ultimate sacrifice, dying, taking the penalty that we deserve in order that we might not need to, so that we can be forgiven. I don't think you call that intolerance in that sort of way. I think you call that, if it's true, love. But also, the Bible also is very clear to say that the, the, it speaks of a day when the Lord Jesus will return, and it says that that day hasn't happened yet, when he will wrap up the world and all these things will be sorted through. It says it hasn't happened yet because he's patient, and he wants people to come to follow him. Thanks. Um, maybe just one more. I see that Christianity claims absolute truth, but this isn't unique. What makes its claims different from other religions? Yeah, great question. And you're, you're totally right, it's not unique. Um, uh, I think what makes it unique is, and as we've been saying, it's the person of Jesus Christ. So you could put it this way, you could take Muhammad out of Islam. I've actually asked um, imams about this that I've had discussions with. And if, as long as the revelation that was, that was brought through Muhammad was still there, Islam would remain intact. Uh, you can take um, Buddha out of Buddhism, and as long as his wisdom was still there, then Buddhism would remain intact. You can't take the person of Jesus Christ out of Christianity and just say, well, we'll hold to his teaching, and think that Christianity stays intact. He's described in the Bible as the cornerstone. My father-in-law's an architect, that means if you take the cornerstone, the whole edifice of the building falls down. So what makes it unique is the person of Jesus Christ, his uniqueness. It's not a doctrinal uniqueness so much as his uniqueness. And particularly his uniqueness through his life, death and resurrection. That the way that we relate to God is through the person of Jesus Christ who dies on a cross to, to make it possible for us to be forgiven and to come back and have life with God forever. And these speak about the evening, so please come along, but that's the way it's being explored. But the uniqueness is the person, fundamentally, I put it to you. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Thank you, Andy, James, and Pete. Um,